The pilgrimage I made in 48 was, of course, very different from the one I made outwardly. That is very different from the one I made in 76. I was teaching at the University of Cairo. It was called the University of Fouad the first at that time. And I was there till 52. And in 48, uh, I realized that there was every year people, a group of people went from the university on the pilgrimage. Uh, there were the teachers, uh, some undergraduates at the university, and some servants, the university servants, as, as they said in, in Cairo, uh, Asertiza, Toloba, and Farashin. <laughs> We went by train uh, to the to the port, and then we went by boat down the Red Sea to Jeddah. It took four days. In those days, the kisva was woven in Egypt, uh, a tradition from the Middle Ages. Actually, we were on the boat with the Kisva. Uh, the Kisva was, was on our boat being brought to Jeddah. What was very impressive, I remember, on the boat going down the Red Sea was the when we were told tonight we passed a certain point. You must all go into Ihram, that is, you must make the, uh, you must enter the pilgrimage, enter into the pilgrimage, which you do by a special, you have to make a prayer and you have to put on pilgrim's dress. It was exceedingly impressive. Uh, after that day, how people were changed. Everybody's life was changed. You see, there are certain rules for the pilgrimage. You not only have to wear special dress, but uh, there are also other rules which are not absolute, but you have to... It does affect one's uh, behaviour. You have to... Uh, keep a guard on your tongue. You're allowed to speak, but you're not allowed to hold long conversations. And above all, you have to avoid speaking angrily to anybody. You have to think of spiritual things. You have to think of death. I said to my wife, you know, these people, uh, it's like as if they became Sufis just for the period of the pilgrimage. That's what the impression we had. Their, their lives were changed. They were really serious people thinking about heaven, about God, and talking in the same way. It was really a wonderful experience that, to be again, with these transformed people on the boat. It, it, it was a help, a spiritual help to us. When we got to Jeddah, there was quite a, a rough sea. I remember that it must have been a, a, a terrible experience for the Egyptian Fellahin women, that is, peasant women, some of them very large and unaccustomed to going out even much and very uh, unaccustomed to walking. It was too rough, the sea, for the boat to go properly into the harbour. There wasn't a proper harbour at, at Jeddah as there is today. And so little boats were sent out to the big boat which we were on. These 
women had to climb down a rope ladder and get out or step off the ladder in onto a little boat which was going up and down in the waves. It must have been a, a death in life for them. They were all saying afterwards that should bring us a good reward, a better reward for the pilgrimage. Uh, as English people, my wife and I, uh, they wanted to make sure that we were really Muslims uh, because they, we had certificates. We'd, we'd entered Islam, both of us, ten years previously, and but they didn't pay any attention to certificates of Islam. They said, no, we want to examine you. So we had to wait in Jeddah till they could collect three elderly men uh, who asked us questions about Islam to see whether we really were Muslims, and then we were allowed to go. They asked us very simple questions like, uh, um, how many prayers are there in the day, for example, and how many raka'at do you have to pray in the afternoon prayer, that sort of thing, you see. And can you recite the Surah Al-Fatiha? Very simple questions. They said afterwards, these old men, we congratulate you on your Islam. And I was by that time rather annoyed, and I said, and I congratulate you on your Islam. They said as though I had just entered Islam because of their approval, so to speak, that they had brought us into Islam at that moment, whereas I'd already been in Islam for 10 years. It was embarrassing because we, they kept all the people that were with us, all the Egyptians were with us, had to wait for us. And then we arrived at the Haram in Mecca about two o'clock in the morning. With the experience of, of uh, going to the Kaaba in the, the middle of the night, uh, it was, of course, very, very different from what it is today. At night, we couldn't see very clearly what we could see in the day, but um, we made the tawaf round the Kaaba. It was the first year that there was electricity in Saudi Arabia, and there was only electricity in Mecca and in Medina. In outside. Uh, there was practically no electricity at all. So we were spared the torment of microphones. At that time, the, uh, the haram was surrounded by a low wall with 19 gates in it. And from every direction as you approached, you could plainly see the Kaaba, which was, and the wall was low out of respect for the Kaaba, so that, uh, and the buildings round the Haram were all fairly low buildings, again, out of respect for the Kaaba, so that it should be the highest building in, in, that, in that part of Mecca.
I hadn't realized, as I do now, that Abraham must have proclaimed the pilgrimage, alayhi salam, about 4,000 years ago. That is, a thousand years before the temple of the Jews was built. The Quran insists, of course, that Mecca is the oldest house, the Kaaba is the oldest house uh, made for men, the oldest tabernacle. And what is not generally known is that Mecca is mentioned in the Psalms in the Old Testament. It is called, it was called in those days, Bakka. That change from B to M is, is linguistically uh, not an uncommon change. And in those days, in the Psalms, it's called Bakka. And many people don't know, I don't think most people know what that means. But in the Psalms, it mentions Mecca as one of the lovable tabernacles of God, the outlying tabernacles of God, that is, the outlying shrines of Abraham. And the Jews used to visit Mecca regularly as a shrine belonging to their great ancestor, Abraham, who had founded Mecca. Of course, he had built the Kaaba, he had instituted the pilgrimage. And they only stopped visiting Bakka, as they called it, because uh, the religion of uh, Abraham became polluted by a sort of pagan polytheism. There were just a few faithful followers of Abraham, that is, orthodox people. There was a stream, a narrowing stream of orthodoxy in Mecca. They were known as the Hunafer, that is, the, the descendants, the spiritual descendants of Abraham. But they were becoming more and more a minute minority, and they had less and less influence. They could not protect the Kaaba from this pollution of idolatry, and they could not prevent the Arabs as a whole from ceasing to believe in the next life. This life was everything. That was what the belief was. So that for a double reason, uh, Islam was absolutely necessary for the Arabs. The Christians could do nothing to help them. They welcomed Christians uh, at the Kaaba, and they welcomed, there was a, an icon placed in the Kaaba of the Virgin and Child. But that was just two more gods for the, uh, for the, the Arabs of Mecca. They, were welco they welcomed these additional gods to their gods, but it didn't put things right. Uh, on the contrary, uh, Christianity was powerless to remedy the state of things in Mecca as it was. And that's why Islam had to be as exactly as it was. It was the only thing that could have brought truth and wisdom and piety back to Arabia, to have restored something of the religion of, of Abraham, alayhi salam. You went out to make the sa'i, that is the, the, the passage seven times between Safa and Marwa. You went out of the gate, which is named after Safa, Berbis Safa, into the desert. And there was Mount Safa, this little uh, rocky uh, uh, 
a kind of, it's not a mountain, it's a hill, a low hill, rocky hill. Uh, and from Safa, we walked uh, in a sand track, the same track where the Prophet had walked previously, quite outside the mosque, to Marwa, which was another eminence about a quarter of a mile away. And we did this uh, seven times, ending up at Marwa. Uh, and uh, it was amazing to see, to meet the people coming. Each time we went, we would see some of the same people as before coming in the opposite direction. Always newcomers were added and then some of the familiar faces were absent. But to see uh, the people, um, especially the men, of course the women are, are, are fully clad, but to see uh, the men, the Arabs, as you never see them, um, with nothing on their heads, their heads bear uh, these white garments, which is the same as that worn by Abraham, Sayyidina Ibrahim salam. To see these people, it was like a wonderful dream. And it was as if they had stepped from the pages of the Old Testament. It was like seeing figures from uh, the time of Abraham himself. On the eighth day, when we were due to, to go to the Valley of Minna, which is a, a barren valley, it was in those days, uh, some distance from Mecca, the bus which was to take the men in our group, or, uh, or half the men, was very late. And uh, we went, in fact, uh, we didn't know what had happened. We kept going back to our lodging and then going back to the harem. And uh, the time of sunset came and uh, still there was no bus. We went and prayed the Maghrib at the Kaaba. And then by the time of the Salat al the, the night prayer, the call was made to the prayer, still no bus. We went to pray the Salat al -Aisha. Imagine being at the Kaaba with only eight other people. There was nobody else in the Haram at all. Uh, the new Kiswa, which was to be put up on the day of the feast, was spread out in all its splendor on the, uh, in the Haram and uh, one was able to kiss the black stone as much as one wanted. There were only eight people praying all together. I had that privilege of praying at the, in a completely empty haram because everybody else had gone. Then finally the bus came. What is totally different from what takes place now is that Minna was a, was a barren valley uh, some distance from Mecca where you spend the night and uh, it was really empty. 
just as sand, uh, a large tract of desert. And uh, that was traditional. The Prophet, when his wife, uh, Aisha, radiallahu anha, asked permission to have a hut for herself, a permanent hut there, so that she could go, uh, uh, she could uh, spend the night in it when she went, if she wanted to make the Umrah. Uh, he refused to allow it. He said, no, nothing must be left. It must remain uh, as it is, without any, any buildings. And so it still was in 1948, just uh, a barren, empty valley. Everybody had tents. Some people just slept in the open. From the valley of Munna, uh, on the ninth day, you set off for Mount Arafat, which is outside the sacred precinct, but uh, on the far side of it, that is, beyond the sacred precinct. To make the pilgrimage is to return to the time of, of Sayyidina Ibrahim. And then, uh, once there in Mecca, you go on the pilgrimage further back. If Mecca is sacred to Abraham, Arafat is sacred to Adam. And it's said that it was on Mount Arafat that, that God forgave Adam for the fall. This is mentioned in, in the Quran that, that God forgave Adam. And it is said traditionally that that it was on Mount Arafat that this took place. Anyway, that is what Arafat represents on the pilgrimage. It's a return to our first state. And a friend of mine who made, he wasn't on the pilgrimage that I made, but he made the pilgrimage about the same time in the late 40s. He said that when he arrived at Arafat, um, early in the morning of the of the the day, the ninth day of the month, that is the day of Arafat, and he saw these white-robed figures on the mount with hands held up in prayer, and uh, uh, he he said, I I didn't know whether I was dreaming. He said, Is this the end of the world? Has it already come? He was quite, quite overcome by the spectacle. The old king was on the pilgrimage at that time, that year, King Abdelaziz. It was remarkable to see his tent quite near to our tent with guards, with long hair and beards. Uh, in their pilgrim's dress with drawn swords standing on duty outside the king's tent. In a way, Arafat as regards the earth, it is the highest part of the pilgrimage. But when we are on the pilgrimage and when we leave Arafat and the time for prayer comes, we face Mecca with our backs to the mountain, inevitably. As regards the pilgrims, they, of course, treasure the whole pilgrimage in their memory, and they don't feel the need to make these distinctions. But certainly, I don't think anybody feels it is an anticlimax to, to come back to Mecca.
The length of the pilgrimage is a very important factor. It needs to last a certain time in order to make its full impression on the people. They need to be penetrated by the, the blessing of the pilgrimage itself. I think that some of the pilgrims never quite recover from the pilgrimage in a good sense of recover, but they, they don't go back to their altogether to their previous life. It makes such an impression on them. There are two things that are necessary for a religion, for every religion. One is, first of all, revelation. The other is tradition. That is, one needs, first of all, a revelation from God, a descent into this world from heaven. And that is a vertical element. Secondly, one needs tradition to perpetuate the religion over the centuries, to pass from one generation to pass on the truth to the following generation and so on. Those two elements are really necessary. One is very conscious in making the pilgrimage that the vertical element here belongs to Mecca, the horizontal element, the tradition to Arafat, because it is only by what has been passed down to us through the generations that Arafat is associated with Sayyidina Adam, alayhi salam. One is nearer to heaven uh, at the Kaaba than one is anywhere else one has, one has experienced, and that is the case. It's, 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 it, one has the impression that time is no longer ways, has lost the, the temporal condition to which we are subject in this world, um, has lost something of its power over us, that the spatial condition has also lost something of its power. One feels also that somehow uh, the barrier between heaven and earth is, well, has part, partly vanished in that space. And this all has to do with what I call the vertical element, uh, which is necessary for every religion. And it is in Mecca that this uh, vertical element, as it were, is to be found, and not anywhere else. When I made the pilgrimage in 76, as I say, the, the Valley of Minna was like a suburb of any European town with all the uh, modern blemishes. Everything that one dislikes about modern towns was there, practically speaking. And Arafat itself, you didn't get the impression anymore of a really holy place. It was too crowded. 
there was no spectacle in the in forty eight you could see the mount distinct from from other places for me in seventy six I have no impression of of Arafat as I did uh, making the first pilgrimage. It's true that it was wonderful to sit in the Haram in 1948, surrounded just by the hills. One could see the Kaaba from every direction uh, when one approached it on foot. Now, uh, of course, one one's first sight of the Kaaba is when one enters the mosque. Uh, out from outside, one can see nothing. It's true that in the Sa'i, that is the, the passage between Safa and Marwa, uh, now you don't go out of the mosque. You go from the well of Zamzam, it's quite a short distance, uh, to uh, the remains of Mount Safa, which is enclosed in the mosque. Only a part of it. It has been more or less destroyed. I find it difficult to forgive uh, that solution to the problems which, which, which arose with the quantities of people. They had to make the haram larger, but could they not have enclosed Mount Safa, it, it made it a wall on the other side of Mount Safa, but protecting Mount Safa, keeping it as it was, because it is mentioned, Safa and Marwa are mentioned as min sha'air illah, among the monuments of God. Safa and Marwa are among the monuments of God. But now they have been more or less destroyed. There is practically nothing left of them. And it seems to me that each time I go, there is still less left of them than there was. Just uh, a few stones uh, placed in cement. And that does seem to me to be unnecessary. Why could they not have left the sand track as it was? just enclosed it in, in the mosque. There, must, there may be some reasons which I don't know. But nonetheless, there's also the individual question. One makes a certain spiritual progress in time. One becomes, uh, over the years, if one is practicing a religion, one becomes more sensitive to certain things. In general, I would say uh, more sensitive to the Baraka. And uh, in the 1976 pilgrimage, I was more sensitive uh, than I was in, in, in 48. In a certain sense, the 1976 pilgrimage was, was better than the 1948 pilgrimage. One doesn't remember the details with such pleasure as I do those of the, of the 1948 pilgrimage. But what remains totally unchanged? is the Barakah.